Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, as Ali already um, mentioned, I would like to talk about how letters and uh, their digital scholarly editions are examples par excellence for the value of interfaces, um, and I mean user and technical interfaces. Yeah, I will start with some remarks about the characteristics of letters and uh, the consequences from that for the scholarly edition of letters. Then I'll present how the graphical user interfaces of some digital scholarly editions address uh, these issues. And in the third section, I talk about applications programming interfaces uh, also in digital scholarly editions of letters. Yeah, letters are a special text type which has some characteristics. First, the content of letters is very heterogeneous. Often different persons, events, publications, and so on are mentioned. Secondly, the letter is written for a certain tracy which has to be taken into account when we interpret the sewers. Beside the text, the letter is if preserved, also a physical object, which certain properties, which has been acknowledged, uh, acknowledged by the tracy. And last but not least, a letter is usually part of a correspondence between two or more persons. And furthermore, the letter is part of a larger correspondence net network. These characteristics have some consequences for scholar editions of letters, of course. Uh, first, scholars often read um, editions of letters very uh, selectively. There are multi-dimensional ways of accessing and using edited letters. The material properties of a letter have to be taken into account by planning and um, conducting a digital edition. Uh, and the context of a letter is important. Yeah, and what does this mean for the graphical user interface? First, we have uh, the access part, and uh, there's um, the feature from the digital scholarly editions of the faceted search. Uh, it is obvious that a faceted search function facilitates the investigation of a correspondence corpus. Here we see the faceted search function in the Karl Maria von Weber um, Gesamtausgabe with multiple options for correspondence, places, and so on. And you see also the number of letters which um, match these criteria. <clears throat> A second point of access are the indexes of persons, places, etc. They were already available in printed scholarly editions, of course, but in digital scholarly editions of letters, uh, they become a main access point. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, as we can see it at the Alfred Escher Brief edition, you find the indexes of events, persons and places, um, prominent place in the center of the home page, besides an access point to the uh, letters directly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, According to my observations, in the last two decades, uh, printed scholarly editions frequently did not provide an index of subjects. Digital scholarly editions thus offer more and more indexes of subjects or a couple of topics as an access to the correspondence corpus. Uh, we see this, for example, at the Darwin Correspondence Projects, where we have, besides others, the topic geology, where related letters are displayed in the right side. The Alfred Escher Brief Edition provides actually keywords as a prominent option in their faceted search. Uh, you see it on the left side. Yeah, as, um, <coughs> with the faceted search and the indexes of different entity types, digital scholarly editions provide an easy access to the letters which are relevant for researchers. This guiding is adapted even in the single letter. Uh, as we see it in the Weber Gesamtausgabe, note here the blue highlighted mentions of the opera 
Adrian von Ostade in the text of the letter. At the right, you see the uh, button which is um, activate, activated. And uh, you can uh, just jump to the right text passage. That was the access, or the, the interface which provides access um, to the letters. In the last 10, 15 years, there has also been in the research on correspondence a uh, material turn, where the researchers not just look on the letter text, but also on the physical object of the letter. The digital medium here offers us the possibility to write facsimiles of the letter beside the text. Yeah, here an example from the Berlin Intellectuals. As you can see, the distribution of the text uh, on the page and the appearance in general of the letter can, display, can be displayed easily by providing a facsimile. Um, and another example from the Van Gogh letters where you can see that uh, part of the text is written across the other text and the paper uh, is of blue consistence. Yeah, for correspondence, we have sometimes also the situation that one part of the correspondence is already edited in printed form, but the other part is not. Should we edit the already published letters again, or should we just refer to them from our own edition? Because of the fact uh, that single letters are, as mentioned, always part of the dialogue, the letter option is unsatisfying. But um, um, yeah, but uh, the first option isn't very economic. For this problem, Günther Fetzer proposed 1980 the Misch edition, that means in English, um, varied scholarly edition, where the letter is published according to whether he is published or not. This means the varied um, means that the edition covers edited letters, partly edited, edited letters, and just abstracts of letters uh, if published elsewhere. This proposal was uh, discussed, but not very um, um, has not been very influenced. But today, with a digital scholarly edition, we have the chance to take this approach and to solve this problem in a more convenient way um, to build a merged scholarly edition, uh, as I would name it. Uh, this is what the August Wilhelm Schlegel edition has done with some of the letters, not at all, but some. You see here a letter which is already available in a printed scholarly edition and which was um, digitized um, for this presentation. And there's a full text uh, which came from this um, digitization. Uh, and there will be no new transcription of the um, letter. Uh, despite of this, um, there's also um, a facsimile of the, uh, of the manuscript uh, offered to the uh, to the user of this edition. Yeah, the already mentioned indexes of persons, places, and so on can not only offer an easy access to the corpus, but also a facilitating or enrichment of the scholarly commentary. Um, sorry. Uh, as you can see in the Weber Gesamtausgabe, a short information from the index entry can be displayed via a pop-up in the text where this person is mentioned. That was not with pop-up, of course, but um, this, um, this role of the index was discussed earlier for printed scholarly edition, but it wasn't implemented until the digital era. It's, now it's more convenient. I can retrieve the data from the uh, index and, not, uh, and do not have to um, take the page at the end of the book. Yeah, the index entry itself can provide uh, also further information about the person, in this case picked from the recently launched digital scholarly edition Alexander von Humboldt auf Reisen. We see a larger description of the persons, 
uh, Georg Fors in this case, and links to the letter in the edition. Um, on, uh, besides this, we see also references to former editions, which are only available in print. That is here the case. Uh, and the list is much more longer, but the screen not. <laughs> um, on the right side, you see automatically generated links to relevant external websites and resources. I will talk on it later. Yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, the context is also very important uh, for a letter, which is usually part of a whole correspondence, a dialogue between two or more people. Uh, and that's why it is important to display the correspondence context of a letter. The Alfred Escher Brief Edition edition has solved this in an outstanding way, I think so. Uh, on the level of a single letter, you can see on the top of the correspondence in a bar um, and capture quickly the development of the correspondence and where the uh, current letter is situated in there. <clears throat> yeah, but not only the direct correspondence context is important, we should never forget that a correspondent usually writes and receives letters also from other people. That is uh, what I would like to call the extended correspondence context. And this is sometimes very important because the people talk and write about same issues with different people and perhaps in different ways. Uh, here you see an example also from the mentioned digital scholarly edition Alexander von Humboldt of Reisen. We have here a letter from Alexander von Humboldt to Samuel Thomas Simmering. In the right top corner, you can see the link Briefnetz erkunden, that means uh, explore the correspondence net. And the pop up uh, shows us some letters sent from or received by Simmering, not Humboldt, um, around um, in the same time period as the letter um, in this edition. With such a feature, we could see some traces of the larger correspondence net, hopefully. <clears throat> uh, and as you, yeah, as, as you can see it, uh, this feature is realized by course search, which was already mentioned uh, this day. Um, and this is the point where I come from the graphical user interface to the application programming interface. And um, what possibilities uh, of APAs, uh, APIs um, do we have? Um, firstly, we have a Beacon, that's just simple text file which um, GND identifiers, YF identifiers, which is uh, very common in Germany, um, and which um, are good for automatically connecting entries of the person indexes via authority files. Um, that's a technology which we have used for the um, index of uh, index entry of Georg Forster, where you can see links to external resources from Wikipedia and to um, other scholarly uh, resources. We have also the CMIF, the Correspondence Metadata Interchange Format, which offer a standardized or where you can offer a standardized metadata of your edited letters. Uh, with the help of web servers like CoreSearch.net, users can search across projects and explore the historical correspondence net. Um, uh, yeah, Arndt Niebisch was uh, so nice to present this <laughs> already. Um, you can have a look on the web page, how this function in a mo at the moment very basic way. Um, but this also offers the possibility to um, generate such a uh, exploring function as we have seen it in the uh, last slide. Yeah, and um, there is a way to provide all your edited letters in TI XML for linguistic text corpora or subsequent use in another edition. Um, current example is the Weber Gesamtausgabe already with um, content negotiation. Um, I will take later on it. Um, yeah, and ADF 
for linked open data. That's just a little point here, but I think um, indeed that's, this is a, especially for um, scholarly editions of uh, letters, this is a future with RDF because we can mix large data sets uh, together and see uh, links which we haven't seen yet. Yeah, and uh, what you can do with these APIs, we have seen some examples in the digital scholarly editions of uh, Alexander von Humboldt, which are already implemented uh, in other digital editions. Um, we can uh, make the metadata and therefore our digital scholarly edition of letter um, accessible through um, central web servers like cross search. It, uh, that the user can search across projects and explore the historical correspondence nets. Um, but we can also um, make some visualizations. That is a very simple visualization just for um, an illustrating example. Um, where we can perhaps um, uh, have a more uh, bigger view on the large correspondence nets and where we have not in the deep uh, and see just a section, but here we can uh, have a look at it on the whole and perhaps see some uh, interesting feature. That's not a result, um, but a uh, possibility to explore the correspondence corpus of multiple digital scholarly editions. In the future, not uh, yet implemented, um, besides some, some examples which are already there. Yeah, and um, I think, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit practical uh, human and uh, here are some smart advice for smart APIs. The one is provide you, provide your data please under a free license like CC BY or CC BY SA uh, or in the public domain. That's important without that every API um, cannot work. Uh, document your APIs, um, that's also important. Uh, use standard formats like TIXML for example. Um, for internal documents and entities provide URIs. Uh, that's an example from the Weber Gesamtausgabe which is a really good example for APIs or for implementing uh, API in uh, uh, digital scholarly editions of letters. And um, yeah, for external entities provide URIs from standardized vocabularies uh, and authority files like GND, YAF, uh, Getty, etc. And uh, yeah, if you provide RDF, uh, please map your vocabulary on standard vocabularies. Um, that's the way where other data sets can be um, uh, find the connecting points um, to your data set. Yeah, and the last example, I'm sorry, it's a little bit uh, hiding. If you provide the total of your data in multiple formats, uh, use content negation. Um, that means that you have an URI, which is displayed here from the Weber Gesamtausgabe, and with a um, .xml, .html uh, on the end. Um, <coughs> You can see this a little bit there. Um, you can, um, you as a user can um, choose the appropriate format, the TIXML, the HTML, and so on. Uh, the Weber Gesamtausgabe, as I said it, is a very good uh, example um, and has documented it already. Yeah, the conclusion. Um, the digital scholarly edition can address characteristics of letters better than printed scholarly editions, as we seen it. Uh, regarding editing edited letters, the digital medium has a better user interface than a printed box, uh, printed book. Um, uh, you see the search, the browse functions, uh, the link functions, and the automatically links generated between the <coughs> scholarly editions. And with the help of the APIs and web servers, we can contextualize a single letter and conduct research on correspondence networks, which was not available before. 
Yeah, and all in all, we have a shift indeed from the reader to the user in this case. Yeah, thank you for your attention and uh, I hope you have some questions. Thank <laughs> you.